Philip K. Dick's writing has been called terrible, genius, howlingly bad, sparkling, flat, unremarkable, imaginative beyond boundaries, shoddily constructed, and predicting of the future, among many other things. His works are as paradoxic and conflicting as the author himself, and most descriptions of both the man and his works would be fitting at different points through his career. During his lifetime, he would produce 44 novels, 121 short stories, and 14 short story collections. Deeming himself destined for writing, he seems to have accepted the suffering and hard times as part of the experience of becoming and being a writer. His determination is nothing less than impressive. What would have made most people give up the pursuit of what must have seemed like a fruitless dream after dozens of published novels and short stories failed to provide the ability to make a living as a writer? Philip K. Dick carried on. He had dabbled in drugs, but always with the clear intention that it would be used as a means to fuel productivity and drive, rather than to make him passive. In one of his heavier drug periods, during 12 months between 1963 and 1964, he wrote and completed an incredible total of six novels. Though the drugs were elemental in his amassment of copy, it would be narrow-minded to hypothesize that the drugs were the only element needed to put his visions down on paper. He possessed something else, an energy, a resolution, a drive, an imagination, that few other authors before or since have shown to possess. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, authors, and dystopian realities. I am your host, Jason Nemoore Hardin, and today, by request of one of our dear listeners, we dig into the Philip K. Dick novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? The novel was first published in 1968. This synopsis, however, is from a paperback edition from 1996. By 2021, the World War had killed millions, driving entire species into extinction and sending mankind off-planet. Those who remained coveted any living creature and for people who couldn't afford one, companies built incredibly realistic simulacra. Horses, birds, cats, sheep. They even built humans. Immigrants to Mars received androids so sophisticated it was impossible to tell them from true men or women. Fearful of the havoc these artificial humans could wreak, the government banned them from Earth. But when androids didn't want to be identified, they just blended in. Rich Deckard was an officially sanctioned bounty hunter whose job was to find rogue androids and to retire them. But when cornered, androids tended to fight back with deadly results. Quote, The true measure of a man is not his intelligence or how high he rises in this freak establishment. No. The true measure of a man is this, how quickly can he respond to the needs of others and how much of himself he can give." End quote. Philip Kindred Dick and his fraternal twin sister, Jane Charlotte Dick, were born six weeks premature on December 16, 1928 in Chicago, Illinois, to their mother, Dorothy Kindred, and father, Joseph Edgar Dick, who went by Edgar. Conditions were difficult. Dorothy, tall and gaunt, did not have enough milk for the twins, and in the first six weeks of life, they would grow more and more sickly by each passing day. With Edgar working all the time and the baby's health not improving, Dorothy needed all the help she could get, and as December turned into January of 1929, Dorothy was helped by her mother, Edna, with taking care of the twins. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be enough and the twins' health continued to worsen. By chance, Dorothy and Edna learned of a life insurance policy that would cover the costs of an immediate home visit by a nurse. When the nurse arrived with a doctor, it was immediately concluded that the children needed to be taken to the hospital. Tragically, Jane would die on the way. 
Upon arriving in the hospital, Philip was put into the incubator and was given a special formula. It was estimated that Philip was a day or so from death himself. Once Philip had gained enough weight, Dorothy was given instructions on how to make the very complicated formula he would need and was allowed to take him home. When Philip was still very young, his mother told him what had happened to the sister he had no conscious memory of, and in his mind, he began to create what would become a horrible sense of guilt. He made himself believe that he had gotten all the milk and that it was partially his fault that Jane did not survive, the other part being his mother's neglect and ignorance. In the end, it would be a trauma that Philip would not be able to ever forget nor forgive his mother for, and for this reason it would also remain a central element in his writing and in his psychological torment, his difficult relationship with women. The death of Jane also brought with it the death of Dorothy and Edgar's marriage, and the divorce would take his father away from much of Philip's life. Dorothy was a complex and problematic woman. She loved her son dearly, but had problems showing him affection. She was physically undemonstrative, emotionally constrained, watchful, and reproving. The guilt she felt for having managed to save Philip but not his sister came out in withholding approval, warmth, and maternal affection, further elements that would influence her son immensely. Later, Philip would state that he believed that his mother was incapable of loving her children. This she had proved in his opinion by letting Jane die. He would also go on to accuse his mother of trying to poison him in an attempt to complete the destruction of them though this was most likely during one of his more unstable episodes. Approaching ten years old, approximately in 1938, was the year he began getting interested in science fiction magazines and stories. By age 12 in 1940, he bought his first sci-fi magazine, Stirring Science Stories, and would go on to read as voraciously as time and money allowed. In 1944, he entered Berkeley High School, he was a highly intelligent student, one who enjoyed advanced English, but kept mostly to himself and rarely spoke in class. His teenage existence wasn't easy. In fact, by his own admission, it was super hard, as his struggles with vertigo and anxiety began in his mid to late teens. Luckily, he had fiction to immerse himself in, and he possessed what has been referred to as an intuitive imagination. His teacher, impressed with his writing, suggested that he send off his stories to magazines. If he took her suggestion to heart, he never spoke of it, and his first story would not appear in a magazine until eight years later, in 1952. Although not enamored with the idea of college and an ordinary career, like his classmates, Philip expected to attend the University of California, Berkeley. In a twist of faith, the pressure of achieving good grades on his final exam in order to be accepted into said university induced an epiphany that would change the course of his life. During the physics test, Philip could not remember the key principle behind displacement of water, on which eight of the ten exam questions were based. Then, as time was nearly up, Philip began to pray, and just as all seemed lost, a voice within him suddenly explained the principle in simple terms. He completed the exam and got an A. This would be his entry point into his spiritual life and his belief in the Christian God. His anxiety continued to accelerate during his school years, and he would soon suffer attacks of crippling panic attacks of such intensity that they would force him to withdraw from Berkeley High. However, he would graduate in June by working at home with a tutor. In 1948, in what would be his first marriage, he married Jeanette Marlin, though they would divorce the very same year, and furthermore, little is known about the relationship. Two years later, in 1950, he married Cleo Apostolides. That relationship would last for eight years. Soon after, he decided to follow his passion and fully dedicate himself to writing and by the end of 1952, he had four stories published. 
1953 would be a giant leap having 30 stories published that year, seven of which were published in the month of June alone. In 1954, he would see 28 more stories published, and in 1955, Rich and Cowan, a British publishing house, chose 15 of his stories for a hardcover publication called A Handful of Darkness. 1955 was also the year he succeeded in getting his novel published, Solar Lottery. It was his first published novel and it must have seemed like his career was finally on the way. Around the same time, his wife Cleo, being a student activist and this being during the Cold War, brought attention and frequent visits by the FBI. These visits would be so frequent that the pair would befriend one of the FBI agents that were monitoring them. Allegedly, they became such good friends that Philip would get driving lessons from him later. Philip and Cleo's marriage would last until 1958, until they moved to a new apartment and Philip met and was eventually smitten with his new neighbor, Anne Williams Rubenstein. Within a few months, Cleo and Philip divorced and he would then marry Anne. During the 1950s, there was a very big difference between being a science fiction writer and being a so-called mainstream fiction writer, and times were difficult. Philip and Anne were poor, so much so that he once said they couldn't even afford to pay the late fee for library books. In hopes of finding a loophole into becoming successful enough to make a living as a writer, he wrote Confessions of a Crap Artist. It was his attempt at writing a piece outside of science fiction, one which chronicled a marital conflict. Still, not being able, or maybe not willing, to conform to the norm of so-called regular fiction, he experimented with several narrative styles and used both the first and third person perspective in his writing. The book was published, but it did not become the breakthrough he was hoping for. His home life, as well as his professional life, was tumultuous, as it usually was, but on the plus side, he was working on a book that would generate some attention. This book was The Man in the High Castle, which he would win the Hugo Award for in 1963. The Man in the High Castle would open doors for Philip and make it possible for him to establish himself as a full-time writer, though he still struggled to make ends meet. Two years after the release of the novel, he and Anne would divorce. But again, he would not remain single for long as he would meet his fourth wife, Nancy Hackett, soon thereafter. Eight months later, in July of 1966, they would marry. As mentioned, he had dabbled in drugs before, but as it was difficult to make a living as a sci-fi writer and it demanded a near inhuman ability to keep pushing out new material, his drug use intensified immensely. He would mostly use amphetamines and in the decade between 1960 and 1970, he published an amazing total of 21 novels. This productivity would unfortunately come to a hard stop in 1970 when he experienced a long period of writer's block. Fortunately, before his bout of writer's block, he would write what is arguably his most famous novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Quote, Today we live in a society in which spurious realities are manufactured by the media, by governments, by big corporations, by religious groups, political groups. So I ask in my writing, what is real? End quote. In the early 1960s, his daily routine consisted of helping his wife with her new jewelry business sending out manuscript after manuscript to publishers, as well as doing copious amounts of amphetamines through the night in order to generate vast amounts of product. He would mix and match different pills, fine-tuning their effects for maximum productivity, but this would also end in manic depressive episodes which led to screaming matches with Anne. Screaming matches that would at times lead them to threaten to kill one another. As stated earlier, Philip Dick's potential for writing was almost beyond human, 
and at times he was churning out 68 pages of final copy a day, meaning that Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep could have been written in approximately three and a half days. The origins of the novel began when he was doing research for The Man in the High Castle. At the time, he was reading diaries seized after World War II of Gestapo officers and agents, in German no less, as he knew it well enough to read the language. Through this research, he became aware of atrocities perpetrated by the Nazis, and he came to believe that those beings had ultimately been monsters who pretended to be human. In one of the journals he read, a Nazi officer complains about not being able to sleep because he was kept awake at night by the cries of starving children. Instead of empathizing with the suffering of the starving children, the officer only saw them as a nuisance that disturbed his sleep. That one line had a deep impact on him. It is not human to complain in your diary that starving children are keeping you awake, he would later comment. This drove him to begin thinking, and he began to play with the notion that people who lacked empathy were androids. Empathy, of course, is the main theme of his novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? In the novel, the android antagonists are revealed to be more human than the human protagonist, which is something that particularly shines in the contrast between the androids and man losing its own humanity by seeing them as lesser than. Like most pieces of writing, the novel has multiple sources of inspiration, including the writings of L. Ron Hubbard, and in particular his novel Fear, published in 1940. Yet a child at the time, this book made a particular impression on young Philip. In a letter to Peter Fitting, written on June 11, 1970, he wrote, What I am writing is really psychological fantasies on the order of L. Ron Hubbard's fear, which impressed me very much and still does. Without fear, I would never have come up with what I do. In addition to the more obvious tone and style of noir fiction, Another influence was the author Theodore Sturgeon, writer of More Than Human, which revolves around humanity being separated into different tiers and being able to control one another through telepathic means. He completed Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep sometime in 1966 and began the process of pitching it around to publishers. He lost a number of close friends in the years after the novel was published in 1968, and, as mentioned earlier, what followed was a terrible dry spell. By July 1970, he was applying for welfare and food stamps, a step that must have surely wounded his pride. He was working on a new novel by then, but unfortunately, things would soon deteriorate even further. In 1971, his marriage with Nancy ended and she moved out of their house in Santa Venetia, California. Following her departure, he continued to abuse drugs and even allowed other drug users to move into the house. This flaw in judgment reached one of its pinnacle points when, in November 1971, Dick returned to his home to discover it had been burglarized. His safe was blown open and money and personal papers were missing. The police weren't able to determine the culprit because of the lifestyle Dick was leading at the time, and even considered their main suspect to be Dick himself for a good while. Wanting to escape his desperate existence in California, he jumped at the opportunity to travel to Canada as the guest of honor at the Vancouver Sci-Fi Convention in February of 1972. There he met a woman who captivated him. Although the romance was short-lived before she broke it off, it had a profound impact on him, but seemingly in a detrimental way. In March of the same year, Philip attempted suicide by taking an overdose of the sedative potassium bromide. He survived and sought help after the occurrence and was deemed well enough to return to California by April. Upon returning to California, he met the woman who would become his Fifth wife, Leslie Busby, better known as Tessa. The writer's block he had been suffering from dissolved, and he got back on track writing again. However, he would continue to struggle. Concerning this, 
Tessa once told that she came home to find 17 rejected manuscripts lying at their door. So dire was their situation at one point that he went out and bought happy dog dog food just so he and Tessa had something to eat. Ten years after the release of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep in 1978, his monetary success finally arrived as back title royalties and resales enabled Philip to live more comfortably. It had taken him 30 years, but it seemed that it was finally paying off. As money came flowing in, there was also no curbing his sudden acts of generosity. Once, he gave a bank teller $1,000 after she confided that she was in financial difficulties. His kindness, however, went beyond writing checks. During walks, he would worry over children playing in the street and would seek out their parents to alert them. Then, in early 1981, came another turning point with a major Hollywood motion picture deal. At long last, 15 years after having completed the book, Negotiations to adapt his novel for the screen had resulted in a solid deal. Ridley Scott would direct the film, which was to be titled Blade Runner, and Harrison Ford would play the protagonist, Rick Deckard. Filming would commence in Hollywood, just a short trip up the freeway from Phil's place, in the first half of 1981. Though proud of the development of his novel into a movie, he kept a certain level of skepticism concerning the potential that the film would actually do the book justice. Well, his skepticism was proven worthy as the fantasies of fame and glory would soon earn a bitter aftertaste after he read Hampton Fancher's screenplay for the movie, which he loathed, to say the least. Not long thereafter, on the night of February 17, 1982, Philip called up therapist Barry Spatz. He was worried because during an interview that evening, he had frequently contradicted himself on and off tape. Furthermore, he was experiencing failing eyesight. Barry Spatz advised him that these sounded like serious physical symptoms and that he should go to a hospital immediately. Philip promised to do so, but ultimately did not. The following day, a neighbor saw him pick up his newspaper. He had an appointment scheduled with Spatz that day, one he missed. An attempt was made to reach him by phone, but he did not pick up. Ultimately, it would be his neighbors Juan and Sue Perez who found Phil unconscious on the floor of his apartment and called for an ambulance. At the hospital, he was diagnosed as having had a stroke, but one from which he could, over time, recover from. He could not speak, but he could smile and his eyes were able to find the faces of the friends and loved ones who came to visit. Further strokes would unfortunately follow, and the final one was accompanied by heart failure. Philip K. Dick died in the hospital on March 2, 1982. He was 53 years old. The gravesite, chosen by Phil's father, is in Fort Morgan, Colorado, a town Phil passed through as a baby boy moving with his family to California. Buried beside him is his twin sister, Jane. Jane's tombstone had been inscribed with both of their names at the time of her death, 53 years earlier. His death came four months before the release of Blade Runner. As usual, I will leave you with one final quote. I want to write about people I love and put them into a fictional world spun out of my own mind. Not the world we actually have, because the world we actually have does not meet my standards. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin. We here at House of Words hope that you would please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash house of words. Until next time, keep turning those pages.
House of Words is written and produced by Christo M. Sanchez. Narrated and edited by me, Jason Nemore Harden. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Christo M. Sanchez and Jason Nemore Harden.